would you please uh, help us to keep our eyes fixed on you and help us to love you more and more. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys can be seated. All right, if you guys would turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter. Garrett will be preaching out of 1 Peter, uh, chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. So if you guys could follow along, if you have a physical Bible, if you could open there, if you have a Bible on your phone, if you would turn there. 1 Peter, chapter 3, <clears throat> and I'll be starting in verse 8. <clears throat> It says this, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you are called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. All right, and kids, you can be dismissed to Kids Church. All right, good morning. Guys, it's good to see your faces once again. Thank you for being here. Uh, we are continuing in our series through the book of First Peter. I hope that you have enjoyed this series as much as I have. I have enjoyed studying it. Um, there are portions of scripture that when you study uh, before you go to preach, you get convicted of more than others. This was one of those for me this week. We're going to look at really five different attributes, five different characteristics, five different traits in verse 8 that Peter's really putting forward and said, this is what a healthy church looks like. This is what healthy Christians, when they come together and they enjoy fellowship together, these are the characteristics and the traits of a healthy church. And man, was I convicted. <laughs> so I hope and pray that you are as well and that we, by God's grace, can be molded and changed and transformed into what God is calling us to be as a church. The first thing here, he says, have unity of mind. Have unity of mind. It feels like in the day that we live in, we can't get two people to agree on anything. It feels like get, get two sinners in a room and have them start agreeing on stuff. And you're going to find more often than not, they don't agree on hardly anything. Right? Is that just me? No, this is where we're at nowadays. Because we have the internet, because we have social media, because everybody is putting all of their opinions out and you better have an opinion on every stance and every social issue, it feels like there's no way to have unity. And yet, God is commanding his people, have unity. Have unity of mind. Because this was not just a command for the church in Peter's day. This is not an impossible task. This is for us today. This church, by the power of God, by the grace of God, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, can actually accomplish this command. Have unity of mind but we need God's help to do so. Here's what Peter's been doing as he gets us to this portion of Scripture. He has, 
he has told us in chapter 1 that you and I, as the people of God, as Christians, are the elect exiles. We are the chosen people of God. And we are, we are exiles. We do not belong on this earth. This is not your home. You are a sojourner. You are passing through. You have a far greater citizenship than your earthly citizenship. And for a church like this, this is something that we need to grab a hold of. That you and I have a citizenship that is far more important than the one stamped on the front of your passport. You and I are a part of a kingdom that does not belong on this earth. It is a heavenly kingdom. We belong to that kingdom. And so for us, that should bring us hope. That should bring us joy. That should bring us purpose. It should produce in us this hope that we have been chosen by God. It says in chapter 1, we've been born again to a living hope. Brothers and sisters, you do not have dead hope. You sitting here this morning as a chosen person of God, someone who has been born again by the power of the Holy Spirit, you do not have false assurance. You do not have, I hope so, for the future. You do not have, cross your fingers, make a wish, and hope for the best. You do not have, making merit, hopefully to get good karma in the future. You were born again to a living hope. And what's that hope? I get an inheritance one day. And what's that inheritance? To live face to face with your maker for eternity. That's your hope. And that's what Peter is building through this book. He wants to produce hope. Why? Because the people in the church that he is writing to that have been scattered throughout the Roman Empire are facing tremendous persecution, and it's just starting. The, the church in this day is going to face some of the worst persecution that the church has faced in its history. And Peter is trying to produce in them a living hope so that when, not if, when the suffering comes for Christians that they have a firm foundation to put their feet upon, to puff out their chest and get ready for that suffering to come because they're going to look directly into that suffering and see that through that suffering, their faith is going to be purified and made more like gold. And they're also going to look up and over that suffering at the hope and the inheritance that they have to come in the future and so that they can face any suffering that this world has to offer them because it is light momentary affliction that is producing for us an eternal weight of glory. And then he gets to individual groups and he begins to address very individual groups with their individual temptation that they're probably going to face as they begin to, to adopt this and believe this and take, take firm stance on, I am an elect exile. I am, a, I am not of this world. I am in the kingdom of the beloved son. I do not belong on this earth. Any suffering that comes, I will be able to face it. And he begins to address temptations for specific Christians. And he first starts off with Christians be submissive to human institutions. The government and the kings and the systems that God has put in place are actually for your benefit. So submit to them. Just because you are an elect exile, just because you are not of this world does not mean that you get to push up the nose at all human governments and say, I have a king that's greater than you, so I don't have to listen to you. No, your king is telling you he put that human government in place for your benefit. And so we submit to it. And then he addresses servants, slaves, household slaves. 
And he says, your temptation as now being people who have been chosen by God and, and taken out of the world, so to speak. You are in the kingdom of the beloved son. Your temptation is going to stuff up the nose at your human masters and say, I have a master that's greater than you and I don't have to listen to you. And he says, no, no, no. Christian slaves, submit even to your masters. Even, even the harsh ones. Because when you suffer for doing good, you display the glory of the gospel more than in any other time in your life. Let me say that again. Whether you are a slave here or not, when you suffer for doing good, you are acting like your Savior. You are displaying His glory in the gospel more than in any other time in your life. Why? Because he suffered. He suffered wrongfully. He suffered, and yet he did good. And then he moves on to wives, and he says, Wives, be subject to your own husbands, even if they're unbelievers. Even if they hate Christ. Submit to them, because your temptation is going to be tried to, to manipulate them and control them. He says, no, your, pow your power and influence in your home comes from being gentle and quiet in spirit. And then he moves on to husbands and says, husbands, love your wives in an understanding way. We talked about this last week. What do you have to understand? Everything. Amen. Who said it? Who said amen? Ryan. You have to understand everything. You have to live with your wife according to knowledge. How did we do last week, husbands? No. Ram says good. Good job, Ram. And this is then he gets to Peter, gets to chapter 3, verse 8. And he stops addressing these individual groups. And now he says, okay, finally, all of you. I've addressed these individual groups inside the church. Now, all of the Christians. All of you. Have, have, this is, you possess this, hold on to this, have this, do not let it go, and do not ever stop doing it, have unity of mind. Impossible, Garrett, it can't be. How can we have unity of mind? Turn to the book of Acts, chapter 4. When Peter here is talking about unity of mind, he's talking about being harmonious. He's talking about being united in spirit, something way deeper than just having the same thoughts. He's not just talking about having the same thinking. He is talking about a deep-rooted feeling and affection and emotion. You are united at the soul level. Turn to Acts chapter 4. <clears throat> and look at verse 32. The church has just begun in Acts chapter 2. Thousands of people are saved. Probably up to this point, Peter's preached two sermons, tons of revival, maybe fifteen to 20,000 people are saved. And look at verse 32. Now the full number, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. This is the type of unity that Peter is speaking of. And we see it immediately in the early church. These people who believed in Christ were united, just, not just in their thinking, not just in their thoughts, in their heart and their very souls. They are united at a level that you cannot be united at unless you are Christ's, unless you belong to Him, unless you have the Holy Spirit in you. So Garrett, how did that happen? Well, I want you to flip one more time to John chapter 17. So keep going to the left. How is it that, that these early church Christians could be united? And how is it that Peter is commanding this of these Christians? And how is it that we today can be united? I want you to show you something really special. This is what Jesus actually prayed for in the garden before he went to the cross. 
your Savior, before he died for you, brought you before the Father in prayer. And one of the main things he talks about is unify them. In verse 20 of 17, he's specifically talking about the disciples, but then he's going to shift to all the believers. He says, I do not ask for these only, the 12 disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's you and me. That's every Christian throughout history. That they may all be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them, you and me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. Jesus prayed for this type of unity. Brothers and sisters, it's not impossible. This is not not something out of reach. Why do I know that? Because the Son of God prayed for it, and the Father will not deny the Son's prayer. Unity of mind. I was listening to a pastor talk this week on a video, and he said he remembers sitting in seminary, and there's all these students around, and the professor gave a marker, and said, hey, I want you all to write an attribute of God up on the whiteboard. And he said, probably 20 minutes of guys coming up and just writing all of these different attributes of God. He's omnipresent. He's all-knowing. He's all-sovereign. He is providential. He is good. He is gracious. He's loving. He's kind. He is all-powerful. All these different attributes of God. He is holy, holy, holy. And the pastor remembers sitting in the class and he, and he doesn't go up, and then the professor says, okay, your turn. And he stops, and he asks the professor, he says, we've said nothing about God. And the professor looked at him and said, what are you talking about? The whiteboard is full of things about God. And the pastor said, we've said zero about God because your definition of love might be different than my definition of love. And his definition of sovereignty might be different than his definition of sovereignty. He said, we've said nothing of God until we find a unifying point to say this is what God is really like. He said, we need to take all of those attributes and then actually go to the scriptures. Because we as a room cannot be unified. We cannot be unified unless we are rooted and grounded in the scriptures. This is your reference point, brother and sister. This is our reference point. If we do not define who God is, if we do not define the gospel, if we do not define humanity, if we do not define community, if we do not define the church, if we do not define salvation based on God's revealed word, we will not find unity. You'll have your own opinions on God and I'll have my own opinions on God. We'll have our own opinions on how church should be run. We'll have our own opinions on evangelism. We'll have our own opinions on the character and attributes of God. No, no, no. We, if we are going to be unified, we must define everything based of what God has already revealed in Scripture. You've heard me say this a lot. I do not care if you leave this room believing a word that I say. I I hope you do not leave this room and when you are arguing some theological point, you do not say, well, my pastor said. That would break my heart. I'm not joking around. Because what I want for you so badly is to actually know your God in the scriptures so that you can leave these doors and defend what God has revealed so that we as a church could be unified at a level that Jesus prayed for, that that we would have a unity that, that images and reflects the very unity of God the Father with the Son. And that's there for us, brothers and sisters. This is not out of reach. But it will continue to be out of reach 
until you as an individual devote yourself to studying the scriptures. We as a church must be unified and we must be unified around what God has said, not based on our own opinions. There's a danger in the church today, and I've heard it so often, and I I heard this from somebody, and I wish I would have wrote down the name. I can't remember, but he said the church is, is really, it's a danger for the church right now to fall into this trap that he calls lowest common denominator Christianity. Because you can go online, you can go to churches, you can listen to pastors online. Unity is the highest virtue today. We got to be unified. We got to cross boundaries. We got to be unified as a church. And what they mean by that is throw this book out. As long as you say, Jesus lived for me, he died for me, he rose for me, then, then I don't need to believe in any other doctrine. Let's just be unified around that gospel. That's failed. <laughs> Because you know who will say that exact same thing? Jesus loves you, he died for you, and he rose again for you. Catholics will say that. Roman Catholics. You'll have Mormons say that. Jehovah's Witnesses say that. You'll have evangelical churches that support and promote same-sex marriage say that. You'll have churches that support and promote transgenderism and say that. You will have churches who support and promote abortion and will say, Jesus loves you, he died for you, and he rose again from the grave for you. We cannot buy into its unity above truth. We must be unified in the scriptures. We must not just say, I'm going to ignore all the other doctrines of the Bible and just hold on to the gospel and say, I can find unity and fellowship with anybody as long as they say the right words about the gospel. We've given too much ground. One more illustration, because I can't help it, and The Lord of the Rings is some of the best movies ever made. That's a joke, but it is a good one. There's this town that's this, this huge city, this kingdom, this, this castle that's built into the side of this mountain. It's strong and it has huge walls. And it's, and it's taken all of this ground around the kingdom. And for so long, the steward of that kingdom allowed for the evil to take a little bit of ground and a little bit of ground and a little bit of ground to when one of the outskirts of the city The evil had overrun that town. And he turned his head and said, yeah, but they'll never get into this city. Let them have the small towns out there. They'll never take the big city. You know what happened? They took the big city. Because if you give ground out there on the things that seem small, and you say, well, let's just give ground out there because we want to be unified. What you are going to start to find is that the very gospel will be attacked. And you will no longer even have unity on the main thing. Brothers and sisters, we must fight for all the ground. But that means we got to know the book. We have to know the book. We have to know it and study it. We cannot say, ah, just let the pastor do that and we'll have a sermon on Sunday. No, you, brothers and sisters, filled with the Spirit of God, you got to get in the book. You got to study the Word of God. And we must not give ground. We must be unified all the way out to the outskirts. We must be unified around the whole counsel of God. Does that mean that we're going to disagree? Yes, we're going to have disagreements on little issues. But hopefully we are 90% in agreement on everything. And there's a few little things that we can have some arguments about. Instead of just finding one thing, the gospel, and saying nothing else matters. Okay, we got to move on. We're not even going to get through this sermon. Okay. He says, have unity of mind. 
The next thing he says is have sympathy. Literally, to suffer alongside somebody. Have sympathy. To feel the same thing that someone else is feeling. Another translation could be compassion. Literally, com, common passions. Common passions. 1 Corinthians 12 says, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Romans 12, 15, Paul says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Here's my question. Is that your instinct? Is that natural for you? When somebody in this church suffers, when a brother and sister is going through a difficult time, do you feel what they feel? Can you mourn with them? Can you weep with them? When your brother and sister is rejoicing and happy and finding joy, are you joyful with them and for them? Or are you somebody that says, I'm going through a tough time, so I will tear you down at every opportunity I get because if I'm going to suffer, you're going to suffer. And I refuse to let you have joy while I'm hurting. When someone in the church that you've been arguing with and fighting with, when they get sad and difficult news, do you share in that sorrow with them? Truly. A true, genuine feeling. This is, remember when I said I was convicted this week, here's one of those areas that I was convicted with. Do you really feel what they're feeling? Or when that difficult person that you've been arguing with within the church, when they suffer, is there that little part of you that's like, yes. They finally got what they deserved. When someone you think is a little bit too self-righteous and legalistic loses their job, what's your response? You start making fun, you start cracking the jokes, you start, no, I, I really, no, I really do care about them, but about time something like that happened, right? Or do you genuinely join in and go, that's devastating. What can I do to help that brother out. I know we've been through some tough times, but we are brothers in Christ. What is your response when the, that person you don't like very much makes a better financial decision than you and then God blesses it? All you crypto guys are like, mm, there it is. There's the conviction. They pulled out, you stayed in. <laughs> And then you're furious about it. And you actually start picking at the person's character. Because they just made a better decision than you did. No, we are called to be sympathetic. True, godly sympathy can only come from a right understanding and spirit-empowered emotions. A right understanding, the main understanding is 1 Corinthians 12. We are the body of Christ. We have to believe that. We have to be unified in that. You are one member of a body. There's no way that if your finger gets jammed in a door and sliced off, that your eyeball is going to be like, ha ha, we didn't need you anyways. No, the whole body suffers when one member suffers. You have to have a right understanding about that. But secondly, you need to have spirit-empowered emotions. I don't know if you caught it. All the things that we're going to look at are all emotions. Even unity of mind is something deeper than just your intellect. God is commanding your emotions. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. But you have to believe I cannot just produce this on my own. 
but I'm going to fall on my knees and beg that the Spirit of God would empower me and work through me, that I would begin to actually have true, genuine sympathy for my brothers and sisters in Christ. The next thing, wait, sorry, one more thing, a danger that I wanted to pull out here. There's this thing happening in the world today, and you can see it all over social media. And some people have labeled it the sin of empathy. There is a sin here. Because people are demanding that their experience, you must validate their experience and all of their feelings, no matter how sinful, and all of their responses, no matter how sinful, you must validate. You must accept it, and you must then join in their feelings and their responses with them. You see this all over social media today. If I have gone through a tough time and something wrong has happened to me, then I have the right to clap back. I have the right to say whatever I want to say. I have the right to riot and picket and do whatever I want. I will burn down shops. And then you must validate my responses and feelings. That is a sin. Sympathy, sympathy does not jump into all of their sinful responses and say, I'm going to just join in with you. Sympathy can, can keep one foot on the bank of the river and hold fast to truth, objective truth, and actually lend a hand to the person suffering and say, let me help you out. Let me get you out of there. I know you're spiraling. I know this is difficult. I know this is hard. But those feelings and responses are actually sinful. And so I'm not going to jump in there with you. I will still hold on to truth. And I will now put a hand down and try to help you out of your circumstance. We want to have sympathy, not sinful empathy. The next thing that he points out here is he says brotherly love. Have unity of mind, have sympathy, and have brotherly love. This is familial love. Love like a family. The family is the number one metaphor most often used in the New Testament when speaking about the church. That's why you hear me say brothers and sisters a lot. I choose that language on purpose. It's not just something flippant. It's because that's what the Bible most often calls the Christians. Your brothers, your sisters, you're of one another. You are members of the same body. But farther than that, you are adopted sons and daughters and you have one father. You are loved for and cared for and accepted by that one father. And you are accepted by, by grace through your faith. Brothers and sisters, if the God of the universe loves you and has accepted you because you have put your faith and trust in Christ, who am I to then to push my hand out and say, eh, yeah, but I don't love you? We're all adopted into one family. We all have the same father. And here he's commanding us to love like brothers. Now, maybe some of you I've had horrific experiences in your family. It's been torn apart. Your relationships between your siblings is terrible or mediocre at best. And so to you, this command is like, no thanks. I don't want anything like brotherly love. Now this love that comes from a brother and sister is talking about true, godly brotherly love. Jesus himself says that he finds joy in calling us brothers, in calling you sisters. He loves to be called one of us. He loves to extend his love to you as a brother and sister. We must adopt that same type of love. I want you to turn real quick to 1 John. So just turn in your Bibles to the right just a little bit. 1 John chapter 4. This is the passage that God used to actually save me. I was born again after hearing this preached as I was sitting in the floor of my parents' shower. 
It says, Beloved, verse 7, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Brothers and sisters, if you don't have a genuine self-sacrificial love, a love that is actually looking out for the best of somebody else, that wants nothing in return, if you cannot love like that, you don't know God. Because if you actually know God and the spirit of that living God is dwelling inside of you, it will produce that kind of love. I want, you to, I want to read something for you. This was, this was a letter written to Caesar Hadrian by one of his spies, if you will, in the second century, so early church. He writes to Caesar Hadrian, he says this, Christians show kindness to those near them, and whenever they, they are judges, they judge uprightly. They do good to their enemies. If one of them have bondsmen and bondswomen or children through love towards them, they persuade them to become Christians. And when they have done so, they call them brothers without distinction. They do not worship strange gods and they go their way in all modesty and cheerfulness. Falsehood is not found among them and they love one another. And he who has gives to him who has not without boasting. And when they see a stranger, they take him into their own homes and rejoice over him as a very brother. And if they hear that one of their number is imprisoned or afflicted on account of the name of their Messiah, all of them anxiously minister to his necessity. And if there is any among them that is poor and needy and they have no spare food, they fast two or three days in order to supply to the needy their lack of food. Such, O king, is their manner of life. And verily, truly, this is a new people, and there is something divine in their midst. That's a pagan writing to another pagan. And he came to the conclusion, because of their brotherly love, God's in their midst. This people cannot actually be like this apart from actually knowing God. Brothers and sisters, the way that we love each other, we have an opportunity to experience the divine in our midst, but also to be a wonderful example to the world, to preach the gospel by the way that we love each other. He goes on in 1 Peter, have unity of mind, have sympathy, have brotherly love, have a tender heart. This literally it means healthy bowels. This tender heart is something deep within your bowels. It's a compassion and a mercy that you have for your brothers and sisters that is coming from deep within your soul. In other words, it's real. It is not manufactured and it's not fake compassion. It's not, I'll give to you, and then I'll, I'll sound the trumpet so that the rest of the church looks at me and goes, wow, what a great Christian. It is a true and genuine compassion. It's a true tender heart. It's a true kindness towards your brothers and sisters. <clears throat> when you have a wound or a tender muscle, the slightest touch sends it feeling all kinds of things, right? Right? Are you rocky and rough and coarse? And it's hard for you amongst your brothers and sisters to actually feel something for them? Or are you like that wound that if you barely touch it, 
you can feel deeply about your brothers and sisters. We need to have a tender heart. In any circumstance, our hearts should easily and properly respond with the attitude of Christ. He goes on and says, a humble mind. Brothers and sisters, nothing destroys unity, sympathy, and brotherly love like pride, like arrogance. Throw it all away if you won't be humble. If we can't be humble, we will not have unity. We will not outdo one another in showing honor. We will not submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, like Paul says. We will think about us and our needs and our beliefs and our thoughts and what we want. And we will trample over anybody who gets in the way. We must have humble minds. How can a Christian be prideful when our Lord and Savior was so humble? He was the perfect son of glory in eternity past, the one who created all things, deserving of our eternal praise, our worship, and our reverence. And yet he humbled himself. Born a baby, not just appeared as a king, humbled himself to even be born, born of lowly people. He took on the form of a servant. He came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Brothers and sisters, we can't claim to know that Jesus and be prideful. We must be humble like he is humble. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3 and look at verse 9. It says, Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. Here, God is forbidding every form of revenge. You don't get to take out revenge on anybody. You don't get to say, well, they did, so I get to. Paul says, leave room for the vengeance of God. He will repay. It is not up to you to seek revenge. And brothers and sisters, this is hard. He says, do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. How many times has someone just slandered you a bit, touched that sensitive point and made a joke about it. And you, it takes every ounce of you to not say something right back to them. Well, you're ugly. Well, yeah, well, at least my kids behave. It takes God-like self-control spirit-empowered self-control to when you have actually been slandered, you have actually had evil done against you, to act like Christ, to have self-control, and not just to be quiet, but to move towards and bless, the text says. It doesn't say just be quiet, turn around, and walk away, and don't talk to them ever again. That's not accomplishing the text. God says, do not repay evil for evil, reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. Speak graciously back. Literally praise them. Find something to bless them with, about. That can only be accomplished if you are born again, a new creature, and empowered by the spirit of the living God. In John 15, 18, it says, if the world hates you, this is Jesus speaking, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, elect exiles, 
Therefore, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Brothers and sisters, for those who desire to live godly lives, those who desire to live in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. If you want to follow Christ, you need to expect what happened to Christ to happen to you. That as you do good, you will be reviled. That as you do good, there will be evil against you. That as you do good, you will be mocked. That as you do good, you will be slandered. You will be called every name in the book. Homophobe, transphobe, bigot, misogynist. You will be called it all. And when it does happen, our job is to bless like Christ blessed. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. In verse 10, he says, for to this you were called. This is the same thing he says in chapter 221. For to this you have been called. And what is he talking about in that context? If when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you've been called. You've been called to suffer as a Christian. You've not been called to the life of health, wealth, and prosperity. It's not in the Bible. You have been called to a life of eternal joy and satisfaction, to rejoicing while you're suffering. We are also called to respond like Christ responded. Not also, we're not just called to suffer, we are called to respond like Christ responded. So these five characteristics that we've looked at in chapter, in verse eight, these are God commanding our emotions. And yet today we would live in a world that would say emotions are just emotions. They are not something that you can command or command obedience upon. Those just happen. And yet God here is saying, no, I command them. So what do you do? I want to leave you with five things to take away. Because you might be looking at all this and going, Garrett, I got none. I'm having such a hard time being unified. I have such a hard time with brotherly love. I, I mock people when they suffer instead of being sympathetic. What do I do? First and foremost, I would say, you might, you might, as Paul says, check to see if you're in the faith. If you're having zero, if you are saying, I'm not experienced one ounce of this, you need to check whether you're in the faith. Go before God. Repent of your sin, turn to him by faith, and trust in Christ to save you. But you might be saying, Garrett, I do have it, but it's rare, it's few and far between. How do I cultivate this? How do I become this type of Christian, that I could be a healthy Christian and we could become a healthy church? How do we do that? Five things. First, repent. Repent. Acknowledge that it is a sin to be unsympathetic. Acknowledge that it is a sin to not show brotherly love. Acknowledge it is a sin to not be unified with the brothers and sisters. Acknowledge it and turn from it. It says in verse 10 here, it says, whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. The first thing you need to do, turn from your sin, repent. The second thing is turn to Christ. Turn away from sin, but then turn to Christ. Run to him, fall on him. Fall and say, Christ, I need you. I need your power, your strength. I cannot accomplish what you are asking me to accomplish. Please come and aid me in this. In 1 Peter 2, 4, it says, as you come to him, a living stone, come to him. The third thing, rest in God's word. Rest in it, not just study it, find rest. Find that portion of scripture that you can go to over and over and over and over. Do not be anxious for anything. By prayer and supplication, 
I'm coming before you, God, and I'm letting my request be made known to you in thanksgiving. Find that verse and go over it. Rest in it, rest in it, rest in it. Like a newborn infant long for the pure spiritual milk. The, third, the fourth thing is pray for change. Don't just go to the word. Beg God to make a change in your life. And the last thing, this might sound like an oxymoron, decide to feel. Decide. Make a choice. Resolve, if that word fits better with you. Resolve to feel. Resolve to say, by the grace of God and by the power of the Spirit, when I want to show evil back to somebody who is showing evil to me, I'm going to have self-control. And then surrender to the Spirit's conviction in that moment. But resolve to feel. Decide to feel. Brothers and sisters, this last thing and we'll be done. He says, to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. This is not prosperity gospel, but brothers and sisters, there is a blessing for you when we live like this. When you, by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, when you actually live like this type of Christian, there is a blessing for you. And what is that blessing? It's Psalm 34, which is what he quotes. Whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. You want to love your life? You want to enjoy your life? Live like this. Turn from evil and, and bless people. Pray for your enemies. Be unified. Be loving to the brothers and sisters. Be sympathetic. Be tender hearted. And you will love your life. And you will see good days. He goes on in verse 11 says, let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Finally, all of you, have unity. Have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is powerful. We thank you that your word is active, that it is truly alive, that it discerns the thoughts and intentions of our heart. Father, thank you that it exposes us and shows us the very area that we need to be worked on, that we need your spirit to come in and change and transform. Father, this room is probably convicted by so many different things this morning, but we praise God for conviction. We praise you that you have brought the spirit of God in such a way that has, that has opened the word and, and pushed it into our hearts. Father, would we be a people who surrender to your word, to submit to your word? Would we be a people who obey your word? And we know that, that by ourselves we are powerless. We have no strength to do this. And so we come and we fall at your feet. We come and we ask, we request that you would begin a work in us. Change us and transform us to become like Christ. To be a church that's unified in mind, that shows true, genuine sympathy, that is humble, that's tender-hearted, and that love each other. Father, would you make us into that? And Father, we trust that you will. We trust that you that have begun a good work in us will see it to completion. And so we ask that you would come and work in us. We love you, Father. Thank you for Christ. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for making us new creatures. 